Hello, and welcome to yet another episode of the Training Tidbits podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge from Animal Training Academy, and it is, as always, so wonderful to be with you today for what is set to be another amazing podcast episode, and I can't wait to dive in and learn all about today's guest and their training odyssey. If you haven't checked the past episodes out yet, then make sure to head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and you can listen to them all there, or you can also find them on iTunes as well. There is definitely something there for absolutely everyone, as well as some really great up-and-coming episodes planned over the next little while. The mission on this show is to help disseminate information about best practice animal training and management, focusing heavily on positive reinforcement and science-based methodology. Because of this, it is vital that the information in this show reaches as many eardrums as we can humanly make possible. So if you do appreciate this free show and want to do your part, then you can help by sharing this episode as far and as wide as possible on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Pinterest, or wherever you are hanging out on social media. That would be really, really appreciated. But let's now introduce you to today's guest. And I'm really excited Because in this episode, we're going to travel to a part of the world we haven't visited before on the show, and that is Denmark, to talk to positive reinforcement dog trainer Jan Ustergaard. Jan runs a part-time dog school called Canis Skiv, where he teaches clicker training, shaping, and basic skills. Jan started his career in the local dog club attending puppy class, and it didn't take long before he was absolutely hooked on dog training. He started learning what he needed to do to become an instructor in 2009, and at the time was taught mostly about luring and handling, and not much about the dog learning new behaviors via reinforcement. A year later, though, he became a trainer, educating others in obedience for competition. At about the same time, Jan met some other trainers, and they were talking more about clicker training, volunteer behavior and back chaining and to Yan this sounded much more what he likes to call real dog training. Yan started to use these techniques with his own dog and suddenly started to win some of the competitions he was entering. Sure enough once again Yan was hooked. In 2010 Yan also became associated with Canis Silborg and became heavily influenced by dog trainers Katja Pedersen and Lotte Sirenzen. Yan took the Canis Clicker Training Certification which he finished in 2011 and started his own school under the umbrella of Canis in 2014. Over the last couple of years, Yan's interest in obedience has been slowly replaced and he now focuses heavily on certain techniques mentioned earlier clicker training, voluntary behavior, back chaining, and shaping. As a person who continually is seeking out development opportunities, Jan then traveled to Norway in 2015 and completed a more advanced instructor certification with Canis, which brings us up to modern day where Jan is about to go international to teach others about his techniques. It is without further ado that I'm very excited to introduce to the show this morning slash evening in Denmark, one Jan Ostergaard. Hello, Jan. Are you there? Yes. Hello, Ryan. I am. Hey, it's so great to have you on the show today, Yan, and thank you for taking time out of your day to be here. Yeah, it's an honor. Fantastic. Hey, we are going to dive straight in now, Yan, with our first question. We briefly talked about in the introduction there, but can you please build on this for us and tell us more about when you first learned about positive reinforcement clicker training and some of the first dogs you ever trained using it? Yes, I can. I was starting in the local dog club with my new dog, not knowing anything about dog training. So uh, I was going to to this uh, club just to learn uh, the basic things. And then I was pretty hooked fast. I was fascinated by the training of, of the animal. It was most luring and a little handling also, some pushing the dog down in a sit, for example, and stuff. But some people think that I, I should go to start on the obedience class. And I did. Again, I was pretty hooked right away. And to say the first competition I was in, the two or three first competition I was in, it was a disaster. <laughs> we were not very good. But suddenly I, I ran into this guy, Thomas Janos, and he was start to talking about clicker training and back chaining and, and stuff. It just sounded right in my ears. I thought, ah, that's something I have to try. And we start training together and, and he showed me a lot of things I didn't know anything about. The clicker, the box itself and other stuff. Then I could see the techniques start working and the thing he, he told me just sounded right. And I was on the right way now. I, I could feel that. Besides that, my dog and, and me were starting to get good points when we were out 
competing. We will start to get some trophies with home. And uh, at the end of the, the season, actually, we qualified for the national championship. So it was uh, very, very good. And I was definitely aware of uh, that clicker training or, or, or the, the thoughts behind it. It was the right way to go. So uh, when the national championship was over, I started to search on the on the internet and then I, I, I found Canis. And luckily for me, there was uh, two young uh, ladies who was uh, just uh, starting up their own education from Canis and Katja Pedersen and uh, Lotte Sørensen. So I uh, joined up for this uh, trainer course. And then the real clicker training started for me there was the basic skills and starting to get floating behaviors and stuff. And also, of course, all the things uh, behind the, the clicker training. Uh, I'll say I'm not a scientific guy in any way. Actually, the opposite, I think. But I like to hear what others have thought and done and then take it out in the field to work with it. That's me. I I like to work in the field with the dogs. So that was my start of, of clicker training. I was finished with that uh, course in 2011. When I started the course, I had a, a new dog, the one I, I have now, and he was with me from the start. So it was like 10 weeks old puppy and uh, didn't know anything. And me, who didn't know much, and then we just started to work forward to something we didn't know what was because we never tried it before. Uh, this way of voluntary behaviors and floating behaviors, and we had to put it all together. It was very cool, was very good, and, and the results we got from the training, it was amazing. Yeah, so you were starting to win competitions, which is a great reinforcement for you as an individual. Exactly like that. The way of training, it was a big reinforcer for me. And how did you feel when you first learned about this, when you first went to Canis? And we're going to talk about Canis in the next question. But when you first went there and you learned this new information, you learned how to communicate with your dog in a new way. Looking back at what you'd previously done, how did that make you feel? That was making me feel very good. And I could see that the way with the clicker training, it was very clear that we were heading towards our goals in a much more clean and sure way. And we jumped over a lot of wrong training. It was more like the right training. So it was very uh, clear for me that clicker training was, was the way to go. Fantastic. And I just love hearing about people's journeys in Odysseys. It's so much fun to learn about. I was wondering now, Jan, if we can talk more about Canis. Can you tell everyone listening a little bit more about this organization, what it is, where people can go to find out? more about it uh, and its links to Clicker Expo in Denmark and any other general information about Canis. Yes, the, the Canis organization has their headquarters in Norway with uh, Morten Eckert and uh, Cecilia Christian. They uh, run it from there. Then they have all of the departments all over Scandinavia and then you go to to Norway to get the, the instructor education. Just right now, they, they're doing it online. I'm actually following it, and it's very, very good. They get some pretty good instructors out there in a, in a couple of months. I can all say to all the, the Scandinavian people who you have to take a shot and, and to sign up on, on that course, that's very good, the Kinis course online. I know there's going to be one more next year. And my colleague here in, in Denmark, Katja Petersen, she was hosting the Kriga Expo 2016 in Denmark. And she's also hosting it this year in November in Denmark. And actually, I just saw that she was on the list for having a, a speak also at the Clicker Expo. So that's very exciting for, for Kenis. And of course, our own Cecilia is also being on that list. So that's very good for us. Uh, the hat off for bringing the, the Clicker Expo to Denmark two years in a row in, in the name of Kenis. So that, that's very good. Yeah, and it's exciting for the Scandinavian people to have this amazing opportunity right at their doorstep. So can you maybe tell us a little bit more about the creators of Canis and how long it's been going for and some of the names you just mentioned? The, the founders, uh, Morten and Cecilia, they are from Norway and they run there. There's a school from a city named Trondheim. They have uh, Morten and Cecilia up there and they have three or four books on, on training, very popular here in Scandinavia. Very good book that is uh, clicker training for your dog. We call it the Bible in Denmark because it's describing everything from the first time you get your dog home to finish and you're ready to go to competition. So 
that's mainly what they do. Then uh, Cecilia also, of course, speaks on the Click Age Forum. Sounds like a wonderful organization, and I'll link to that in the podcast right up. And I personally interact with a Scandinavian dog trainer pretty much on a daily basis who has been heavily influenced by Canis. So I can attest to the high skill level of this individual, and they actually were taught by you, uh, funnily enough, or they train with you. So let's talk a little bit more about your current techniques, something that you described to me before the podcast as a pretty square way of training. Can you define for everyone listening what you mean when you say pretty square and why this is important for you? I think it's uh, pretty square because I don't allow much uh, movement in the in the training or talk. And when I, I, I do the training, meanwhile, my dog is uh, working. I have to hold my working positions. So when I work with my dog, it's the dog who works and me just watching. It's my job to have a good timing, to set up the environment right, and have some, of course, good reinforcements in my pocket. And, of course, set some good criteria also. But when the dog is doing the work, I just stand with my hands down the side and not doing anything. A click with the clicker is it's not just, uh, in my opinion, a signal to the dog. Yeah, right, you did that correct. It's also a signal to me that when I hear the click, I can lift my hand to the pockets or get the ball or, or, or anything. That's releasing me too, in a way. So I don't want all the disturbance in, in my training. So the dog has to, to look at my hand. Is it going for the pocket or is it going for my ball or something? The dog has to work. And when the click is all released, that's what I call square because when I'm going out and, and do my workshops, I meet a lot of people who, who move their, their arms and, and stuff or say stuff. Uh, I think the, the working position is, is very important because if your dog is retrieving something and it's running towards you with something in its mouth and your arm just, you just move your arm up to your pocket because you want to reward fast or something why should the dog not let go because the guard's hand i call it guard's hand because it's the one who delivers the reinforcement so so the guard hands move i have to for example throw out my stick in my mouth or if you're doing the shaking part you want to have this uh, volunteer behaviors if your hand is just moving for the pockets you can almost uh, lock the dog just waiting okay give me something give me something and when you uh, working in, in in the work position the dog knows okay when he stands like this when the handler stands like this i have to work to get my click for example that's what i call uh, square training many people have said to me oh that's too much and, and you can do this and this but but i'm i don't agree in when when i go out and, and do some shaping it's for me very important to keep my working position and have no bags with food hanging in front of me so the dog has anything to stare at or, or something to lock the dog on. so it's very important that you are boring yell and scream and and do whatever you want after the click i like that and i think it provides very clear communication when you're teaching this to your clients do you have any particular technique that you can suggest to the listeners that can help them achieve what you just described a lot of people find that quite challenging sometimes if they're a very animated person and they they're moving their arms and they're talking a lot uh, if they wanted to try out your technique that you just described do you have any specific tips you can offer the the one with the with don't move your, your hands you can put your thumb in your pocket so have a target on your on your legs with your hand so you don't move before the sound of the click but also a good thing is to work two and two and, and say okay will you tell me if i do anything like moving my hands or saying something lots of like you said lots of the handlers they're not aware of it or you can tape it on video and watch it there you can learn a lot of seeing your, your own videos i was making one video some day and i saw myself every time i click because i have to deliver the the tree fast so every time i click my hand was almost at the height with my pocket. I saw that on, on, a, on a video one day and I, ah, I have to do something about that. So work together two and two or uh, some of your training on the camera. That's a good one. And then target 
your hands to, uh, to your pants or something. Yeah, great tips. And thank you so much for sharing that, Jan. It was a lot of fun to learn about. We'll move to the next question. And as mentioned in the introduction, you are about to take your dog training internationally this year and you're traveling to the US to do some events. This is really exciting. Can you tell everyone listening a little bit more uh, about what you have planned for your time away? Yes, I can do that. I have been posting some videos on, on my Facebook page and, and suddenly a day, one day, a lady from Minneapolis, uh, Stephanie, she was contacting me and asked if I had a thought of going to U.S. And of course, it, it was a dream to go to the U.S. for some workshop, but I never thought of it on that way. I have been doing some, some workshop in, in Spain for two years uh, in Mallorca. It was very nice. And uh, yeah, I like to go out. It was actually one of the things by, by posting all my, my trainers, how can I get some jobs uh, around the world to go out and see how, how other people train and, and meet some exciting people. And when she wrote me, I was, of course, very flattered. And I was not sure that the economy was going to hang together. So I, I just said, yes, you can sign me up. I'll come with my family and we'll take a, like a vacation. I contacted by actually a, a Danish a woman called uh, Camilla. Uh, she from Montana, uh, up in Billings, Montana. So she was saying, oh, when you are in the States, can you come to my part also? Uh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, of course, I traveled to, to the U.S., so, so why not? I said yes, uh, actually right away, because I was also positive reinforced by them asking me, of course, and it's just an opportunity I can't uh, let go. And I have seen a lot of course, uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and videos with training from yeah from America and England. And so on, I think I got something to offer. I like to call it the the Scandinavian way. I, I think it's a little different from from what I have seen. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know, but it's very exciting. And and I think the the people who join up for the seminars are. The workshops they're gonna have uh, they're gonna have an experience so we will add some links in the show notes for this trip and if you're in that area the workshops are going to be in september is that right Jan? yeah that's correct in the second and third weekend in september Fantastic. And if you can make it to one of these, then make sure you get yourself there to learn the Scandinavian way. You definitely don't want to miss out. It's going to be a lot of fun. We are sadly now, though, heading towards the end of the podcast episode, but this is okay because this is one of my favorite parts of the show. I call it story time. Yan, I was wondering if we could ask you now to share two or three stories from your experience and some important lessons that you've learned along the way. Yes, I think one of the most important lessons I, I learned along the way of this clicker training is that all people are looking different on training and you have to adjust as an instructor. You have to uh, adjust to your handlers and you have to talk to them so they can understand in, in small pieces. So in small criteria, when you're telling something, you have to say as little as possible so the client is not going to be confused at any point. You can't talk too much as an instructor. You have to do it in, in very small parts. That's a big lesson for me because I, I, I like to talk, but I've seen uh, people do great work when, when I'm not talking and just like pointing out the thing they have to do. So we just like working on small steps. So you teach your humans with square training as well. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can say that. Do you have any specific stories you can think of? Uh, yes, I have. I have a story when I was uh, making uh, one of my videos. The dog has to back around me. And every time the dog went into the heel position, it stopped. I, I couldn't uh, break that one. Because it was, I have done so much obedience and when he goes to the left side, it just stopped. And when I put my platform down, he could do it, no problem. Uh, he could break the heel position and, and go further, but not without the platform. So I was thinking and, and I didn't know how to break that. A very big experience for me was when the dog I have made with the platform. So he just did it 15 times maybe. 12 to 15 times, I repeated it. And then I kicked the platform out. Meanwhile, I was rewarding him. The next time, he just went up because he thought that the platform was there, but it wasn't. But the next 
move I made when the platform was not there the second time. I was so happy because I then knew that the dog had made a, a breakthrough. He understood that was a, a very exciting moment for me. And I experienced it in other things of my training. When the dog does this thing and you can see it's aware of what it's doing, then you know you had learned your dog the, the thing you, you're working on. When you see the dog are doing it because it knows to do that. Yeah, and I'm sure there's a lot of people listening to this podcast and I'm sitting here remembering similar stories in my time, especially after significant challenges work out a way of communicating what you want to your animal it's a very very good feeling isn't it it is it's like when the west ham wins the uh, against man united or something it, it was just uh, it just uh, i just love it yeah just don't want them to play stoke city because then it wouldn't be a good feeling <laughs> <laughs> And with this behavior, because you mentioned earlier, you do a lot of filming and you've got some great videos online. Do you have a video of this particular behavior? I do. I have it on my on my Facebook page. Great. Maybe we will share that in the podcast write up and people can go and have a look at what you just described. Yeah, you do that. I was actually sitting and watching YouTube and Facebook and watching a lot of cool uh, dog stuff. And I was just wondering... Why can't I find any videos where, where you, you see how they get from, from A to B? So I, I started doing some tricks of my own and just starting to, to film, not the, the whole training session, but, but when the behavior or, or the trick was finished, I was trying to split it up in the parts that I am going through and then put it on. And of course, with the back chaining and, and stuff and make the, the video. That, that's pretty really how much I came up with ideas of doing some of my videos. There was not much stuff on YouTube. YouTube. There's a lot of cool tricks and a lot of cool things, but, but not how to get there, actually. So that was one of the things that made me do that. Great. I've watched a couple of your videos and I, and I look forward to seeing this one and sharing it on the podcast right up and achieving your goal of getting more people access to that. Such great stories. And thank you so much for sharing this. Does, as mentioned, bring us to the final question of this episode, Jan. And for this one, I want to ask you, please, to take us into the future and share with us what you would like to see happen with clicker training and positive reinforcement dog training in the next five to ten years yes ryan like i said i'm not a guy who's doing a lot of research and, and stuff but i think where i like to see clicker training and positive reinforcement training in, in the future is i, I like to see it get used more, if you know what I mean. Here in Denmark, for example, I think in the area I live in, there is a lot of very good clicker trainers and dog trainers. And I actually think it's very important for the instructor who stands out to teach clicker training to get out to as many as possible. Just like you said in the intro, you have to you have to get it out there. It, it's not just instructor job. It's something you have to when you are a positive reinforcement trainer. You have to spread the word. It's your call. You have to do that. So as many as people as possible gets to to hear about the way to train. Uh, I still think there's a long way to go. I don't know if it can be fixed in five to ten years. I don't know. But I'm sure if we start doing our crusades now, then uh, we have to achieve many more people who can do this uh, form of training. Because it's a good feeling you have when you go home after a long day. You can go home and say, okay, we didn't win anything today, but we trained in a good way. I think that's how I like to see the future. I really like that. Such great ideas and hoping that this comes true. And I like what you said there about if you're a positive reinforcement trainer, then you framed it as it's your calling to spread this information. Jan, this has been so much fun and we really appreciate you taking the time out of your Sunday evening to come and talk to me today. So from myself and from everyone listening, a huge thank you, Jan. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. It's been a pleasure to first of all meet you and, and also do this. It's very great. Definitely. And I hope that all of you listening out there have enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. As mentioned at the start of the podcast, this show is and will remain completely free, where we will travel all around the world talking to positive reinforcement animal trainers, best practice enrichment specialists, and experts in behavior management. We really appreciate all of you tuning in. And I want to build upon what Jan just said and ask that small favor of you. If you do enjoy these podcasts and as a positive reinforcement, 
practitioner yourself, you feel that the information held within could help other trainers and animals whom this information might not have reached yet, then please share this episode wherever you can. On your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your Instagram, your Pinterest, your Snapchats, whatever you use, so that as a community, we can do absolutely everything within our power to do, as the wonderful Susan Friedman says, and change the world one animal at a time. That's it from this episode. Until next time, see you later, alligator. <laughs>